four. Let's stand together so you can really sing it, all right? Here we go. Oh, land of rest for the seated. We're going to uh, just go through quickly and let you look at the announcements in the bulletin. Give Brother Ballou as much time as he needs in the morning service. We brought the teenagers over. I think sometimes we need to uh, get our young people more acclimated to thinking about what God wants them to do in the future. We have Connor and, and I don't know the two girls' names. Kaylee? And who knows, they may, Brother Blue, end up being a missionary because they were over here this morning. Might get to go to, you know, deepest, darkest Africa with big snakes. Or like Brother Blue did, he went, uh, no, that's, that's, I'm mixing my stories up here. Dr. Miller was talking about a Bible college somewhere that you walked in the front door and went to class and walked out the back door and it was on the beach. That wasn't your place, was it? No, I, I, I whispered to Carolyn when he said that, yes, yeah, suffering for Jesus. <laughs> All right, faith promise offering will be taken today. Brother Blue is going to have a lot more to say about that. How many of you did your homework assignment? Let me see your hands. Two. Hmm. You remember I gave you a handout last week to read about faith promise. You gave it back. Oh, well, that was a homework assignment. How many of you now read it? Let me see your hands. All right, now we have a few more hands. Okay, he's going to be going over that more, and then you'll see choir practice tonight. I think you can all see the rest of them through there, so we're, we're not going to take time to go over them. Brother Ballou is a uh, doctor. It's actually Dr. Dennis Ballou, and he is uh, a long-term missionary. He's been in mission work, I think they said last night, 50 years? 48 years. And so we're glad to have him. He's going to be here all day. We had him scheduled last year, I think it was, and we had a snowstorm, and he could not come. And we ended up not having church that morning because it was so bad and the snow was so bad. But we were glad to be able to schedule him today. I appreciate Marshall and uh, Laura for letting him stay in their home last night and tonight. And I'm sure they're doing you right. If they're not, you let me know, and I'll slap them around for you, okay? So, Brother Blue, you come. He is a, was a missionary down in St. Thomas. Is that correct? And he'll tell us about that. And I'm not going to take his time. I'd rather hear from him than, than me try to explain all of it and what's going on. So, Brother Blue, you come. Okay. Well, it's good to be here with you today. And I trust our time will be beneficial. Um, I take it, I close here for the Sunday school hour at what time? What you want, when you want me to? Quarter tell. Okay. Well, we got a few minutes, and that's good. And uh, uh, my name is Dennis Ballou. That's spelled B-E-L-L-E-W. My wife uh, uh, wasn't able to come with me, and I'm not on, excuse me just a minute. 
I was told to turn this thing on. I'm, I'm wired. And uh, now I'm really wired. Woo! Oh, my. Well, uh, and I forgot that, but I could have done with what was here. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about faith promise a little bit in the Sunday school hour, but I just want to talk uh, for just a moment about what I have done. Uh, we did a lot of our mission work in the West Indies. Now, that's the islands that start from Florida and go down uh, through the ocean down to South America. And uh, we've served on several of those islands over the years. And uh, we spent a lot of our time in uh, the Virgin Islands in St. Thomas. And I uh, ran the Blue Water Bible College there, taught a lot of young people. And uh, we have uh, graduates that have gone out all over the West Indies and some even into the States and even into some other countries. So we thank the Lord for that. But I've also served in some other places. Uh, we've been over in Asia. Uh, helping over there in more recent times, and we uh, were in uh, Singapore and Malaysia uh, serving in those countries, and then we uh, also served in uh, New York City, which is a foreign mission field, uh, really. Uh, if you go up there, you'll understand what I mean, you know, the, the mix of people that are in the place. And uh, we were up there for five years, and we were working with uh, Dr. Miller up there, at International Bible College, as well as in the church ministries. So we've uh, been in and around a lot of different places. Uh, I've also done some mission work in Australia. I've done some mission work in India. Uh, and, you know, and uh, I've done some mission work in the U.S. I mean, you know, I've helped some churches that were struggling a little bit, even in the U.S., and taught uh, young people uh, in the U.S. as well. And so God's been good, and uh, as long as we're healthy and well, we're going to try our best to do that and continue to do that. Uh, we've been married 51 years. Uh, we've been serving the Lord for 48 with BIMI, and before that time, I served the Lord in various ways through the local church. Uh, we had a daughter, uh, well, it'd be two weeks Thursday, had a stroke in her mid-40s. And my wife has really been trying to help her and the children and the, and the husband. And so you pray for Melinda Wilson. Melinda Wilson. Put that on your prayer sheet. Do pray that she'll have, uh, if, if at all possible, complete recovery from this, this stroke. She has a blocked cardiac artery on the left side of her uh, neck going up. And uh, it uh, caused a, a stroke in the back of her head affected her vision. Uh, uh, some of that has come back. It affected her right side of her, uh, you know, her, her, the use of her hand and arm and her leg and such, but she has that pretty much back and, and she was having trouble talking and thinking and she got most of that back. But uh, she's not like the old Melinda. Okay, so pray that uh, she will get some more recovery in these days. They say the first 90 days are very critical and so uh, you pray with us about that. I appreciate it very much. Um, now my wife and I, because we're really in the retirement years, we do more assistance and relief. And uh, you know, we, a missionary needs to get away and if we're available, have our schedule open, we'll go and help. We even went to Alaska and helped a mission work up there uh, a couple years ago. Now that was an experience after working in the Caribbean and in hot countries. That was a real experience. In fact, if you had to go outside, just getting ready to go outside. I, I was getting ready one day and I was gonna go outside and I sat down and my wife said, what's wrong? I said, I think I need a nap. <laughs> just to catch myself I mean the work you have to go through to get covered up because you got to cover everything you don't want any any of your uh, your flesh exposed once you go out the door and uh, so you you got this uh, you know this space suit on you know parka and oh man it's it's something else and uh, Instead of riding in a car, you ride on a snowmobile, and <laughs> it's, it's, it's a different, different way of life. But uh, anyway, 
the Lord's been good and we've enjoyed uh, you know, serving him uh, all these years. My wife would have enjoyed being up here with you, uh, you know, but uh, she's really busy right now with the daughter and, and uh, couldn't, couldn't make it. Um, sometimes when I go on a little short trip, she doesn't go because, uh, you know, we've got some grandkids and you always want to spend a little time with the grandkids. And last year we were out of the country more than we were in the country. I made many trips and I was in Haiti and Trinidad and then Tobago and then I was up in Delaware uh, up here uh, last winter in February and then I was down in the West Indies again and and uh, and last summer we we were in Aruba uh, helping a church there that uh, the missionary pastor left and wasn't coming back and they're still struggling a little bit but we're hoping they can get a somebody that you know will be there on a more permanent basis but right now it's people that are kind of filling in and uh, trying to help them. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it was really constant right up to Thanksgiving. And then we kind of had a little break and, uh, and then we got busy again. So uh, we thank the Lord for that. Now, uh, I would like to talk about the faith promise. And really we do everything by faith. We just don't realize we do it. When you get in your car and you take your key out and you put it in the ignition, you're trusting that uh, when you turn the key, the car is going to start and you can go down the road. Uh, you turn the lights on at night and, uh, and you're driving and uh, you know, you're really living by, living by faith because the lights only expose about 200 feet. But by the time you get that 200 feet, it exposes 200 more feet and uh, so forth. And, uh, well, I think that we can do uh, missions by faith as well. We expect the missionary to live by faith, but uh, I think it's good for all Christians to live by faith and trust God uh, to work in their lives and use them for the glory of God. And a passage of Scripture I feel that uh, really opens itself up to this is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And uh, I would like to read, uh, well, the first uh, nine verses, and then we'll talk about some of the things that took place uh, that, that in, you know, uh, is in this passage of Scripture. Second Corinthians chapter 8, we'll read verses uh, 1 to 9. So if you have your Bibles there, open up to that passage, and uh, I'm going to read these verses. Notice what it says in the Scriptures. It says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So he's writing to the Corinthian church and he's trying to encourage the Corinthian church, but he's using the churches in Macedonia as an example and talking about how the grace of God was really, you know, seen evident in their lives. In verse 2, it says, How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Now, these people were not rich people. They had poverty. And, uh, and they had affliction, a great trial of affliction. In other words, they, they were struggling in life. Yet, out of this situation that they were living in, they abounded. Uh, and were very liberal. In verse 3 it says, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. So they, they gave what they could. But then, by faith, they gave more than they could. And in verse 4 it says, Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this is referring to the saints in Jerusalem. The believers in Jerusalem were under persecution by the Jews. And they were under persecution by the government. I mean, you know, Rome wasn't too happy about what Christianity was doing. And there were persecutions. And uh, in verse 5 it says, And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. In other words... They were dedicated to God. And then, uh, following the leadership of the Lord, they were willing to 
uh, give of themselves and be sacrificial and, uh, you know, and uh, collect an offering that would help the uh, persecuted Christians that were in Jerusalem. In verse number six, it says, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. In other words, Paul says, I'm sending Titus to you in Corinth. And uh, a year ago, you promised that you would also participate in this uh, collection that we're taking up to help. And uh, so Titus is coming to help you understand the importance of what uh, you're, you're about to do. In verse 7, it says, Therefore, as ye abound in everything... Now, the Corinthian church sometimes is criticized, but notice what they did abound in. They abounded in faith, so they were faithful believers. Uh, they abounded in utterance. In other words, they went out and talked about Jesus Christ. And they abounded in knowledge. In other words, they did study the Scriptures. And in all uh, diligence... In other words, they were trying to be diligent, even though they did have problems. Now, I'm sure that Safe Harbor never has any problems. I mean, you know, I'm sure that's never the case. And yeah. Nobody's ever upset, and nobody, uh, you know, but, well, we know better than that, don't we? But they were, uh, they abounded in all diligence. Uh, they were trying to do their job. And in your love to us, in other words, Paul says, you've been gracious to us, and see that you abound in this grace also. The grace that he was talking about was the grace of giving. He said you need to really do your best in giving because uh, there's others that need help. And of course, uh, the way that others that uh, haven't ex uh, experienced the love of God, the way that we're going to reach them is for the Christian to reach out to them uh, personally, if they're right here in your community, and then by missions, if they're not, you see. In verse 8, it says, I speak not by commandment. In other words, God didn't command that he speak to him like this, but by occasion of the forwardness of others. In other words, I'm talking to you in this letter and, and wanting you to do what the churches in Macedonia did and to prove the sincerity of your love. Now, we can say we love the lost, but if we don't give and are not involved in propagating the gospel to the lost, then it doesn't seem like we love them as much as we think we love them, okay? And so it's important that we uh, put action to our words. Uh, we love to see people saved. Well, if we really love to see people saved, then we need to do things in our life that will help people come to Jesus Christ. Giving and missions is one of them. Talking to people about Jesus is another. Making sure that the Christian literature is available is another. I mean, there's a lot of different things we can do uh, to, to bring that about. And uh, it says here that ye through your, his poverty, uh, excuse me, uh, sincerity of your love. Now, verse 9 gives us the example that we need to follow. Notice the example. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he came from heaven, he was beside the throne of God, yet for your sakes he became poor, he took on the form of a man, came to the world, came into the world of mankind, uh, ended up going and dying on Calvary, shedding his blood. Why? That ye through his poverty might be rich. In other words, have salvation, having fellowship with God again. And Paul says, and herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who had begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. In other words, he's referring to the fact that they made a commitment a year before that we will be involved in this collection to help the persecuted saints. We're going to be involved in it. Now, I want you to notice some things here in these, uh, in these verses. First of all, I want you to notice who they gave to. Notice who they gave to. And we'll go back here and just kind of look at these verses a little bit. In verse number five, notice it says, and this they did, not as we hoped, 
but first gave their own selves to the Lord. First gave their own selves to the Lord. They first gave themselves to the Lord. In other words, they were saved. But not only that, they were devoted to Jesus Christ. They gave themselves to the Lord. Now, you won't have any problem with church uh, being mission-minded and helping reach out and get people saved if everybody is really devoted to Christ. It'll never be a problem because the importance, you know, it's so important that we reach the lost. And uh, it won't be a problem. In Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is a reasonable thing to do, you see. And uh, probably there's none that are unsaved here. I don't know, but it might be. But uh, if you've never trusted Christ, you have to start there. And once you've trusted Christ, then you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we need to give ourselves unto the Lord. But notice also there in that verse, they first gave their own selves to the Lord. And then Paul says, and unto us by the will of God. In other words, they were separated unto God's people. When Paul and his, you know, the the fellow workers that were with him came by and uh, they, they talked to the church at Corinth. Uh, the church responded. And what did they say? A year ago they said, hey, we're going to get on board. We're going to take part in this. We're going we're to participate in this collection to help the persecuted ch uh, Christians that are in Jerusalem. We're going to help them. Well, today uh, we don't have any persecuted Christians in Jerusalem per se, but we do have uh, people out preaching the gospel that do need help. And one way we can help them is to, uh, you know, to send funds so that they can be there and do what they're doing. Now, I've, been, I've lived in foreign countries a lot. And years ago, when I first started going uh, into the West Indies, they would have a stamp. And when you would go into one of those little countries, they would stamp your passport. Actually, they stamped the back of a copy of my birth certificate. I didn't even have a passport at first. <laughs> and I had this photocopy of my, pass, of my birth certificate. Well, they'd, they'd look and they'd say, okay, that's who you are. You know, you got this paper, it says who you are. And back in those years, if you were an American, it was no trouble traveling. And so what did they do? They'd turn it over and they'd stamp the back of it, okay? So for several years, back years, you know, in the past, uh, I got by with just a photocopy of my birth certificate and they would just stamp the back of it, you see. Uh, that's who I am and they would stamp it, you see. Uh, but here, who did they give to? Well, first they gave themselves to the Lord and then because they're devoted to Jesus Christ, now they want to participate with the other believers in Christ and be involved in helping the saints and the sinners and they did it by giving uh, to that offering. And, uh, and that help uh, went a long way, I'm sure. Now, I'm sure back in Jerusalem at that time, when people trusted Jesus Christ, I'm sure immediately they were ostracized from their family. And once they were ostracized from their family, that meant that, uh, <clears throat> that they lost uh, their position in business because families, you know, had business, and so that means they have no job. That means, you know, and that's why in the, uh, you know, in Acts where it talks about they had all things in common, Christians had to help one another because uh, people lost their jobs, lost their livelihood, uh, you, you know, especially women because women didn't work in the workforce back then. I mean, it, it, was, it was a serious thing, and they went through some very hard times, the Christians in Jerusalem. Now, the Christians up in Antioch and in some of the other cities, uh, it was a little different. Uh, and, uh, of course, not too long after, uh, after the uh, people in Jerusalem, they started preaching the gospel in these other places, then, then you find that you have Gentiles being saved as well as Jews, you see. And then the 
the whole thing changed a little bit. But uh, who they gave to? They gave to the Lord, gave themselves to the Lord, and then unto uh, the other believers that were making appeals uh, by the will of God. Is it God's will for me to be involved in the missions program of my church? Yes, it is. Uh, that's one way I can fulfill the Great Commission in my life. I give to missions in the local church that Francis and I attend when we're in the States. We give to missions through their missions program. It's a little deaf church, uh, not, a, not a lot of people, and they support five missionaries. I think it's, uh, they, they, uh, they put $300 into mission work every month. And it's just a little group of people. And, and, and uh, they do that by faith. And they uh, trust the Lord uh, to bring the money in each month so that they can support their missionaries. Now, I want you to notice also in this passage of Scripture, I want you to notice what they gave. What did they give? Well... Uh, what did they give to God? They gave themselves to God. Now, it's one thing to trust in Christ and ask Him to be your Savior. But it's another thing that usually happens in a young Christian's life, not long after they've been saved, when they give themselves. In other words, once they've trusted Christ, then they commit themselves totally to to God. They gave themselves. And, uh, and, and in Romans 12, 1, he beseeches them by the mercies of God that they uh, present themselves holy and without blemish to the Lord so that they can be used in the work of the Lord. Now, you as a member of the church here, you can be involved in the ministry of this church. You can talk to people about Jesus Christ when you're not in the church building. Right. Now, the church is the people. The building is just where you meet for your services. So the church is active when you as an individual have trusted Christ and you've committed yourself totally to the Lord. And then when the Holy Spirit prompts you to say a word to somebody, maybe a neighbor, a relative, a friend, and, and you uh, maybe give them an encouraging word and talk about your faith in Jesus Christ and, and tell them that this has helped you in your personal life, you see. And a lot of people are looking for any help they can get today. That's right. For any help they can get. And, uh, you know, life's not easy. <laughs> Life can be hard. And especially if, you're, if you don't know Christ, you can, make some, uh, you, know, you can make some decisions and life takes a, uh, you know, it's kind of like you start going down the wrong path. And you start hitting, uh, you know, the obstacles in the way and you start falling in the pitfall, uh, pit holes and, 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 you know, and then, you know, it gets almost where life's not enjoyable at all, you see. And sometimes that's when if you say a word and talk about how Christ has helped you and the Holy Spirit is with you and, and hey, people say, hey, they must have something I don't have. They seem to be enjoying life, even though life can be tough. They're enjoying life. And so uh, they, uh, what did they give? They gave themselves. And then they were willing of themselves to give. They were willing of themselves to give. Uh, in uh, Romans chapter 9, Paul talks about his own people. And he says, uh, uh, you know, I would be happy if I was accursed, if it would help my people know the Lord. That's what he says in Romans chapter 9. And, uh, you know, I don't think God wants to curse us, but if we have that desire to see other people saved, then it'll come out in our actions and in what we say. You know, people will know that we're a Christian and know that we're, we're wanting to uh, be of help to them. Now, another thing I want us to notice in this passage is why did they do what they did? Why did they do it? Well, 
I think we see that in the example we have in the text. In verse number 9, he says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You see, I'm glad Jesus did what he did. I'm glad that I have salvation in Christ. I'm glad that I've been able to go and, and witness to people and preach the gospel and teach the word of God. Uh, for many years, I'm glad that I can do that. And uh, I'm going to continue doing it as long as I can do it. Okay? And uh, I'm glad that I can do that. Why? Well, because I realize the importance of it. And... Uh, why do I do it? Well, because of what Christ did. He gave himself. He wasn't selfish. I mean, he went to the cross. He died. He was buried. He rose again, you see. And, uh, and I want you to notice Paul's reasons because he gives them in this book. Turn to verse, uh, uh, chapter 5 of uh, 2 Corinthians. Notice one reason that Paul was doing what he was doing. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, the Bible says there, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So he says, one thing that drives me is the love of Christ. Christ loved me, and I, I, I appreciate it, and I want to show my appreciation, and I want to tell other people, Christ loves you, and he died for you. And then another reason we find, notice in verse 10, same chapter. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. One thing that drove Paul was, Hey, one of these days, I have to give an account. And one of these days, whether we like it or not, all of us have to give an account, just like Paul did, you know, a few years ago. And then the third thing that, uh, uh, that uh, drove Paul, uh, notice verse 11 of chapter 5. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. See, Paul's saying, one of these days, those that are not reached, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to be judged. They're going out into a Christless eternity. They're not going to be saved. They're going to end up in the lake of fire. And the thing is, if we get the gospel to them before that time, before they die, and they trust in Christ, they've been saved from that. But Paul says one of the things that drives me is the judgment seat of Christ. Everybody's going to be judged. Christians are going to be judged so that we know what rewards we're going to get. But the unsaved are going to be judged and end up in the lake of fire. So uh, that's why they gave, you see. And it's important for us to give. And then I want you to notice how they gave. Notice how they gave. First of all, they gave by the will of God. That's what verse 5 says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 5. For this they did not as we hoped. Not as we hoped. But first they gave their own selves unto the Lord and unto us by the will of God. In other words, they, fought, they were obedient to the Lord. If we could get the Christians in the Christian churches in America to be obedient to God, we would have no financial problems and missions, none whatsoever. You understand me? It's sad that we can't. We have too much materialism in America. You go and you, you go to some of these other countries, you realize we've got a lot, a lot more than we really probably deserve. You know what I mean? We've been greatly blessed. And of course, there's nothing wrong with us, uh, you know, using some of that 
to uh, be a blessing and people get to hear the gospel uh, themselves. And then I want you to notice how they gave. They gave liberally through their poverty. Verse number two says, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded. How can you have deep poverty abound? You know, if you don't have hardly anything, how can it abound? Well, it, it just, it's, it's what everybody puts together. Last night when they took the total up, everybody was shocked. But each one gave something. Each one participated. And if each one participates here at Safe Harbor, you'd be surprised what you can do in mission work and getting the gospel out, not just here at home, but also abroad, you see. And the Great Commission is given, and it says, uh, you know, unto all the world, you see. You have to do it in your Jerusalem, your Judea, and your Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You see, you have a responsibility to reach people you've never seen or heard or don't know anything about. You're responsible to reach them with the gospel just like you're responsible to reach people that live next door with the gospel. You see, so uh, here uh, we need to be liberal through their deep poverty. And then notice they also gave how? Well, with much entreaty. They begged Paul and his team to accept their offering and be their representatives to take it down to the persecuted saints in Jerusalem. Would you please do this for us? And then notice verse 3. They gave sacrificially. They gave to their power. Verse 3. They gave to their power. Now they, they did what they could do. Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. In other words, I don't have it right now, but by faith I believe that God will give me something else that I can give. Okay? One time we were going to... Uh, we were going to take all of the Bible college students to the Bahamas and from the Virgin Islands to the Bahamas. Uh, that meant a ticket. Had to fly through Miami to get to the Bahamas. That meant overnighting in, in Miami. That meant uh, getting them there and, of course, getting them home. And when we added that up with all, I don't remember how many students there were in the student body at that time. And, we, and when we knew that we were going to have the conference up there, I think two and a half, three years before that, we started putting money aside, trying to raise money so that the students could all go. We took the whole school up there, okay? And we started raising money for it. And of course, the students paid what they could and then we raised some money. We sent out letters. We went to churches in the area, talked to them. Uh, we made calls. We did everything we could do. And of course, we raised the money. All of the students got to go. And it was a great eye-opener for the students. Because when we were in Miami, we stayed uh, at a, a church there, uh, Lakeland Baptist Church. Lakeland Baptist Church had a children's ministry. They had a little ranch, Circle C Ranch. We stayed on the premises of Circle C Ranch. And I, I had the pastor who had been there. He started the church many years ago. And, uh, and I got him to come and talk to him and talk about how by faith he went there when he was just out of school and started preaching the gospel, and started the church, and then started the camp, and started a Christian school, and, 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 every, and some of those students, you know, sometimes you can tell people something in a classroom, but if you can take them and show them something that God has done, okay? We have a graduate of Blue Water Bible College that has been teaching at that Christian school for years now. And any time I have to go through Miami, if I need a place to stay, she makes sure I have a place to stay. Yeah. The pastor now is gone. He's not there anymore. But she makes sure I have a place to stay. And she'll come and pick me up at the airport, and she'll take me back to the airport. And, and 
listen, uh, this matter to their power, and that's all they could do of themselves, but by faith beyond their power, all that God could do by themselves. But when we were raising the money to do that, I said, Lord, I want to do something so I can give to this because I wanted all the students to go. I wanted everybody to, to go and, and be there and witness the conference and also see these ministries that we were going to be in, uh, around uh, because sometimes when they see it, uh, it, it fires them up, you know. And uh, so uh, there was a fellow that was running a, a, a place there on St. Thomas. And just in passing, I, I mentioned something, and, and uh, he said, listen, we need, we need some cabinets fixed. We had a wood shop on the campus there at Blue Water. I said, well, what would you pay? He told me what they would pay. I built the cabinets. <laughs> and what he gave me for building those cabinets I put into that project to make sure students got to go to that conference. I didn't have the money to, to give that offering at that time, but I, ha I took some time, a little time here, a little time there. I built the cabinets, and what he paid me, that was by faith, I was putting that in so that, you know, they got to go. And it really meant a difference in the lives of some of those young people that we were training. And then, uh, uh, so how they gave. They gave by the will of God. They gave even though they didn't have a lot, they sacrificed and gave. Uh, they begged people to take what they had so that it could be used. They gave sacrificially what they could, and then by faith beyond what they could. And uh, well, what happened then? Well, notice verse number 8. It says, I speak not by commandment, by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. What does this do? Well, I'll tell you what it does. It shows that you really love Jesus Christ. You see, it shows that you love Jesus Christ. I'm hoping that this year, by faith. I, I hope that you'll sacrificially give in your mission offering, but then I pray that you will say, Lord, by faith, during this year, I want to give more, and I want you to show how great you are and make these extra funds available to me, and when I get something, I'll realize that you've given it to me because you want to see me live by faith, and I'm going to put it in the mission offering. Okay? Because you can ask God, help me give $10 a week or $10 a month. This is something I think I can do in my budget. But then you can also say, God, by faith, I'm trusting you to bring money or things that I can sell, or whatever it is, a way to get some revenue to put in. You see, I'll tell you how a little boy did it. According to John chapter 6, there was a little boy that wanted to hear Jesus speak. And he went, and there was a multitude of people there. And uh, while he was there, Jesus said to his disciples, uh, what are we going to do about these people? We've got this multitude of people. Now, how many is a multitude? Well, it'd be a lot more than what we got here today. It would be a crowd. According to the scriptures, it was 5,000 men, plus women and children, plus the disciples, plus Jesus, plus a little boy. And uh, they said, what are we going to do to make sure these folks have something to eat? Because they didn't come prepared they didn't bring food with them so they could eat. But the little boy had his lunch. <laughs> I guess his mother wrapped up five little loaves and two fishes and gave it to him. And the little boy, to his power, he was willing to give his lunch. 
And Jesus prayed, took that lunch, he prayed, and then they had the people sit down and the disciples broke the bread and broke the fish and fed all the people. Everybody got to eat. And according to the account, 12 baskets full were taken up after it was all over. In other words, they ended up with more at the end than what they started with at the beginning. We always end up with more. The more by faith we live for God, the more God blesses us because you never outgive God. Okay? So I hope when you turn in your faith promise commitment, it's a commitment not to the church, not to the pastor. This is something you prayed about as a person. And by faith, you say, Lord, I want you to use me as a channel through which mission work and projects can be done. And I'll give it here at Safe Harbor Baptist Church. And then the church as a body of believers, they will pray and say, Lord, how should we dispense of this money so the gospel gets out? You understand? But everybody is involved by faith. That's what it's all about. Dear Heavenly Father, bless to our hearts the Word of God today and help each one that's making a decision today that will be for the rest of this year until this time next year. May the faith promise commitments by faith be more for next year, this coming year, than they were for this past year. And if they are, we'll rejoice and thank you And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.